Hello my friends and welcome, let's start from the military map review as usual. We don't have lots of the updates for today and the only update we have near to Avdivka, so Krasnohorika, the northern part of that town and unfortunately Russia was able to gain more territory. Just yesterday the Ukrainian officials said that this is the no man's territory, Russia is unable to get it under control, but today we have the confirmation that they surpassed this obstacle and the now very close to Avdivka town. At the same time they continue to push to this side. Hopefully you can see it. The problem for Russia that all of the blue marks you may see in this area are the artillery job of the Ukrainian army, so we target them very precisely. Nevertheless, Russia continued to send more and more resources. They still have the resources, not as before, but still. So how far are Russians from cutting the only supply line in the northern part of Avdivka town? Let's measure the distance. So it is the very important crossroad and to the place of the front lines is just two kilometers, a little bit more than one mile, so actually very close. There is however the alternate supply line which goes from Avdivka over here and then Siverna to Tanenka. The problem with it is that it is also kind of close to the front lines on the south, 1.6 kilometers exactly one mile. Because of that we may say that there are two critical areas for Ukrainian army to defend this very important crossroad and this village Siverne. And from what we see Russia advances exactly to those places. The roads are not so important for now as they will be very soon during the wet season. The weather miraculously is still dry on the eastern side of Ukraine. So Ukrainian army may use the field roads to supply our group in Avdiivka. The very important thing for Ukraine is not to concentrate on defending Avdiivka as it was in Bakhmut. Because of Bakhmut we lost many of the forces which could have been used on advancing on the south during the counteroffensive operation this summer. Russia knows that so they will continue to push directly to Avdivka trying to encircle and force Ukrainian army to leave their place. For now I am not saying that the situation is catastrophic for Avdivka, no, and Ukraine sent more reinforcements, but it is better to go through every of this scenario because Russia will continue to push. For Ukraine it's important to defend the area till winter time, till the cold period of the year. In that case Russian advancement will slow down. Well it is already slow, but in that case they may stall with their attack attempts at all. About importance of Avdiivka, indeed it has the huge meaning, even strategic meaning for Ukraine or for the Russian army. It is much more important compared to Bakhmut city. Avdiivka is basically the potential key to liberate Donetsk, Makivka, Horlivka, Yasinovata and all of the settlements around it. Now it's like the fist of Ukraine that goes through the Russian defense. But the Ukrainian army is just unable to keep it like that forever. We really need to assault on this direction because Russia obviously has many more resources. First of all human resources, they have more aviation and more artillery shells. So if we keep staying in defense like that Russia will send more and more reinforcements obviously with severe losses but finally they might reach their goal at some point. The other way out for Ukraine is to advance on a different direction. For example not far away from this area in Bakhmut that is what our military command is doing. So Russia is forced to keep their resources near to Bakhmut and not send them to Avdiivka. Unfortunately Ukraine now sends more reinforcements which should have been used on the south advancement. Plus Leopard tanks were spotted in this area. We also have some not good news about it, let me show you. Not far away from Krasnogorovka Russia was able to hit the Ukrainian Leopard 2A6. Even though it caught the fire but the tank wasn't destroyed but damaged. The fuel leaked to the ground and ignited. The crew successfully left the machine and they're okay. This is the other photo from the different perspective of the same tank Then the fire is over. You may see that the smoke is coming from the turret so probably there is some internal damage 
down to the tank, but from outside it's pretty much okay and could be evacuated, but it is definitely very close to the Russian positions, so I'm not sure whether our engineers would be able to evacuate it in a nearby perspective. Maybe even Russians might take this tank during their advancement, it is not a good scenario for Ukraine. At the same time, Russia continued to lose their tanks on the front lines, for example, this is the T-72B3 modification, it was targeted from the 19 km distance, which is around 12 miles, so the smart shell was used to target this tank, it exploded at some altitude and then released the shell. The tank crew had no chance in that case. So the fight is very tight with losses from each side. Obviously Russia has more losses compared to Ukrainian army, that is because of their tactics, we call it the mid wave and also they use old weaponry compared to Ukrainian army, which gets the weaponry from the Western allies. Still not the best possible weaponry, but we have it and it's good. In their attempts to pass the minefields, Russia continued to lose lots of the infantry and infantry armored vehicles. Today there was one more case of their vehicle just kaputted in the middle of the minefield. My friends, more of that stuff you may find on my Telegram channel, it is available in the video description just below, or you may just scan the QR code available on the screen, but if you watch me from the phone, how would you do it? Ok, there was the kaboom last night that potentially may slow down the Russian advancement around Avdivka or even stop it, because Ukraine targeted the largest fuel depot, which is located not far away from the Donetsk city, it is the place or it was the place where Russia took the fuel for their tanks and armored vehicles, not every fuel tank was damaged, but the infrastructure was damaged dramatically, plus the railways which are important for the Russian logistics. One more achievement for Ukrainian army to Today, the Russian convoy of Chuvashian warriors was ambushed by Ukrainian artillery and drones. All of the vehicles in that convoy were just burned out. 120 soldiers lost their lives. Chuvashia battalion just finished its existence. It was already reported in many of the pro Russian groups. And those are the soldiers of Chuvashia last winter. They are happy that they are going to Ukraine. Every one of them will never return back to Russia or Chuvashia, which is also the part of the Russian Federation. One more achievement, the largest military industrial power plant that produces the gunpowder and explosives for the Russian army was targeted today and there was the huge fire. The factory is located in Perm, so far away from the Ukrainian border. Russia uses it to produce the artillery shell, so it's very important for Ukraine to target the Russian infrastructure, the military infrastructure, far behind the front lines. That is how we might stop the advancement of the Russian army in Avdivka and not only. This picture was tweeted today by the Ukrainian border control service. They also fight against the Russian aggression. So today 300,000 number was registered in Ukrainian statistics for the Russian losses. Well, this number obviously might not be correct because Ukrainian statistics is not very precise, but based on the information from the independent and sources and also the statistics which is coming from some of the intelligence services like British Defense Intelligence, this number is not far to be truthful. It is also including the private military armies that were fighting or are fighting for the Russian Federation, plus the militia of DPR and LPR self-proclaimed republics. So more or less this number is correct. About Ukrainian losses, Ukraine doesn't publish the information about it, this is the top secret information. And and I also think that we don't have the real number of it. However, according to the book, if you are in defense mostly, you have losses 1 to 3. It means that Ukraine could have lost around 100,000 soldiers since the beginning of this war. And based on the images coming from the Ukrainian cemeteries with all of those Ukrainian flags, which our guys put only on the graves with Ukrainian defenders, I might say that unfortunately it's very close to 100,000 soldiers. Plus in Mariupol alone more than 100,000 civilians lost their lives. 
So in general, together with civilians, I think Ukraine has the same losses as only the soldier losses uh, from the Russian side. Again, it tells a lot about the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Their goal is to take the ground and get rid of our nation. Here we have more statistics about the Russian losses. So in general, as average, they mobilize around 20,000 soldiers per month. And per month, according to Ukrainian statistics, they have those losses. 17,900. So they are still in plus by 2,100 soldiers each month. Profit, netto, brutto. After all, they were able to put aside those human resources and now they try to use them in Avdiivka. Generally speaking about the human resources, basically Russia has unlimited human resource compared to Ukraine. In Ukraine, there are around 33 million people left since the beginning of the war. Russia has almost 140 million people population. It means that if needed, they might potentially mobilize around 6 million soldiers. Yes, they will not have enough equipment to equip those soldiers. But there was the period in the history of the Soviet Union that the soldiers were just fighting with a simple weaponry, for example, in the Second World War. That's why if you compare the losses for the Soviet Union and for Germany, Soviets lost almost two times more soldiers compared to Germany. So I do not exclude the similar scenario for Russia in Ukraine. With the massive mobilization of the Russian men, at least from the low perspective, they already took everything to restrict the rights of the Russian men in case the massive mobilization will be announced. The interesting statistics is coming from the Russian Federation. People in Russia were asked if President Putin decides to stop the war in Ukraine, would you support it? So 70% do support and just 21% voted for the war to continue. Awesome, you may say, but it's not like that. There was the other question which is quite similar to the first one. Would you support the withdrawal of the Russian forces from Ukraine and finishing the war? So all of the occupied territories would be returned to Ukraine back. In that case, just 34% supported this move. And here most of the Russians support the war because they gained the territory. Why should they return it back? And that is what Putin is doing. This is his aim. This is his goal. That is, this is where he got the support for his actions. It also shows the chauvinism and imperialism of the Russian society. They were brainwashed by their own propaganda and willing to continue the war. Doesn't matter on the losses, but they want to keep the ground. Because of that, I have no doubt that Putin will be re-elected next year. Ukraine to start the talks to join the European Union. We have some good news which are promised by Kuleba, who is the Minister of the Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. So what are the good news? Probably one one more bureaucratic step for Ukraine was jumped over. Now, a couple of the positive words about the Ukrainian corruption. I expect that the EU membership will help Ukraine to fight the corruption. And we don't need the funds for that. We need the European Union bureaucracy. Well, actually, I do not like the European bureaucracy. It creates obstacles for people, but it also creates obstacles for the officials and for corruption. If we compare, for example, Ukraine and Romania, before joining the European Union, the corruption in Romania was even bigger compared to nowadays in Ukraine. So after the European bureaucratic institutions were established in Romania, the level of corruption dropped down. So it could be a nice choice for Ukraine. The problem is that it might take years for Ukraine to join the European Union. Let's switch to the other world news because they are also touching Ukraine. I will explain you. So Israel continue with their ground operation in Gaza. They advance from the three of the points. Two of them are on the north and one is over here. They are very close to reach the shore and cut this part of the Gaza. From what I see, they are not willing for now to go deeply inside the urban environment which is located over here they mostly go through the open territories of gaza fighting in the urban environment will cause lots of the losses for israeli army however now we received reports that they entered the ground communication or it's better to say underground communication of the hamas forces here is the other map it is mostly the same also israel advances from the sea too the united states of america continue to support their ally Israel. There was the record number of the flights 
conducted to Tel Aviv, mostly C-17 and C-5 airplanes. Those are the transport military airplanes to deliver some of the goods to Israeli army. However, we have some rumors for now that President Biden might veto the military support of Israel. It is not because the United States is afraid of the protests. No, no, no. They will continue to support Israel. But it is because the minority of the congressmen doesn't want to vote for Ukrainian support. Biden's proposal is to combine the military help for Ukraine, for Israel and for Taiwan in one. But the Congress probably will not vote for that. So there are some political clashes happening, but after all, I'm sure that Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan will have the support from the United States. Let me tell you why the United States needs to support Ukraine with more military help. Let's imagine that Russia occupied Ukraine. It means that they'll have 35, at least 35 more people in their orbit orbit of interests, so will become the second Belarus and part of their Ukrainian territory will go to Russian Federation forever. So will become the Russian proxies and if Russia decides to start the war, for example, here or here, they will use Ukrainian army for that as well. And Belarus too. The expansion of the Russian Federation in its current form never ends. Otherwise, Russia would collapse. It's the classical empire, the last one on our planet. They need to take more ground and fight to keep the power. And believe me, after several years under the Russian propaganda, Ukrainian society will change. Yes, for now it looks impossible, but there were some examples in the history. But if Russia decides to attack, for example, Poland, and Poland is the NATO country, United States would have to secure Poland with their army. So in that case, you guys will be fighting for Poland against Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. It is the possible scenario if Russia reaches its goal in Ukraine. Same happened in Chechnya before. There were two wars in that region between Russian regular army and Chechens. Finally, Russia established their control over Chechnya and, you know, Ahmad Battalion, Kadyrov, they are so pro-Russian, they receive the money from Putin directly, they torture and brainwash their people for decades, so the similar stuff might happen in Ukraine, but in a bigger scale. And actually, Chechens were forced to fight for Russia in Ukraine. That's why, guys, we need weaponry now to Ukraine. Otherwise, the circumstances will be very bad for the United States and Western allies. That is what Putin wants in this war. I explained it to you in the simplest way possible, and I don't understand that some of the United States senators don't get it. By the way, here's some statement from Kadyrov. He said to shoot everyone who would riot in Chechnya for any reason. There was some news today that Yemen declared the war against Israel. But Yemen is divided into many parts. Finally, I was able to find this map, which shows what area of Yemen controls by some turn force. So this area, it's the most populated one, is controlled by the pro-Iranian forces Houthis, who actually launched the missiles towards Israel. Some of those were shut down by the Saudi air defense. So they keep around 20 to 25 percent of all of the Yemen under control, but it is the most populated area. The largest part, more than 50 percent, is controlled by the official Yemeni forces, Yemeni government affiliated forces, but the population here is much lower compared to this place. And we have some other regions controlled by different forces. So those guys are backed by Iran and they are anti-Israel and pro-Hamas. But Israel officials say that it's not a big threat for their country. I think that it is true because between Yemen and Israel there is the huge desert. So what those Houthis might do is to launch more missiles, but luckily Saudi Arabia helps a lot by intercepting those. Okay, we have the state-of-art torpedo made by Hamas. You can see that many people are needed to carry it to the sea and later on it may actually float or stay under the water. It is controlled remotely, but I guess that it is mostly made for this propaganda video. Plus, it is not that big to cause the severe damage to the ship. Well, it also depends on the ship size, but it is not really under the water and could be easily spotted from any kind of the ship. 
and might be targeted using the simple guns. I'm sure that it's not the Hamas massive production how they did with the rockets. I hope for the better news tomorrow. Now my friends, don't forget to press the like to this video and also if you want to support my job, you may check out some of the links in the video description just below. Special thanks for my Patreon supporters and the sponsors of my YouTube channel. Guys, you are awesome. I wish you all a peaceful sky wherever you are and have a great time.